Uh, today's program is Bug These Plants, and it is about carnivorous plants, um, which do eat insects. Um, and just uh, a little recap on who's giving this program is Oakland County Parks. Uh, my name is Amanda, and I am a naturalist at Red Oaks Nature Center. Uh, we have two nature centers in Oakland County Parks, Red Oaks and the Wint Nature Center that is in Independence Oaks Park. And we have programming at both of those. And like tonight, neither of those in your own house. Uh, so we do have some upcoming programs that are coming up. Uh, just to give you a little teaser, we have virtual programs every month. Uh, so the next one for November is don't eco friends don't trash cans, and that's going to be a kit that includes some aluminum cans and some different things to do with those. Uh, our December kit is does not have virtual instruction. It's a self led kit, so it just has written instructions in it with all the things that you need in order to make a Yule log, uh, except for a hot glue gun and hot glue sticks. You'll need to provide those as well. Um, um, but just a little teaser for some upcoming virtual programs for next year, because we already know what the topics are, so we might as well tell you. Uh, January is going to be a bat real estate program, so you're going to learn about the bats of Michigan and uh, how you can build them a house, and you'll get all the things in your kit to build a bat house, and we'll tell you all about the proper way to place it. The other um, February kit is going to be another self-led kit, and that will be on making paper beads. So that's kind of our uh, eco-friendly kit for the next season. And then some of our in-person programming that's coming up next will be our creepy cryptid hike. Uh, we'll be at Wint Nature Center on October 22nd. Uh, and it's an evening hike, so those are always a lot of fun. Uh, and that one will be talking all about different Michigan species uh, that have not been confirmed in the wild, uh, but some people have claimed a site, such as the Michigan dog man and uh, some other friendly cryptids like that. Uh, here at Red Oaks Nature Center, we will have the Leaves of Change fall color hike going on on October 23rd. So if you didn't get enough hiking at Wint the night before looking for Dogman, you can uh, look at some leaves here at Red Oaks. And then the following week um, at Wint Nature Center, again, we'll have the Eye of Newt and Tail of Dog uh, presentation. And at that, that's another one that I'm going to be leading uh, that has to do with the way that plants were referred to and how we got some of those, um, those kind of magical names and that the eye of newt doesn't really have to do with anything with a newt um, or the tail of, of a dog is not actually using a dog's tail. That's kind of our Halloween program. And then we also, another tease, is that we have some programs here. The Owl Prowls are always very popular hikes. Um, so I just wanted to give you the dates for those at Red Oaks and Wint, so that as soon as, they're, they're not available for registration yet, but so you know once they are available that you can sign up for them um, before they're all sold out. And then we also have a special program uh, here at Red Oaks Nature Center called The Dating Game. It's our Valentine's Day program uh, where we're going to be taking a, a look at some of the uh, more appropriate for older audiences uh, events that happen in the lives of some of our wildlife. So those are my commercials for Oakland County Parks and for the Nature Center programming. Uh, we can go ahead and get started on our carnivorous plants. Uh, so the first thing about carnivorous plants that we want to remember is that they are in fact still plants. So even though they eat meat, they don't actively chase their prey. They can't, I don't want to say they can't move because they move in the breeze, but they can't, you know, chase after anything and they can't move under their own power. 
They do use photosynthesis to get energy from the sun, uh, just like all plants do. And, but they, they live in soil that has so few nutrients um, that they make it up for it with the very small animals that they lure in and then they digest with enzymes. So we're gonna get back to this um, when we talk about how to care for our own carnivorous plants and the fact that it has so few nutrients. Uh, before we get too much farther into it, I was just thinking that there is one thing you might, might want uh, that I did not provide in the kit is if you have kind of a mixing bowl or, um, or something shallow to mix it in. I, I originally was thinking that we could just use the container that the, the sand and soil is in, but um, it might be helpful if you have like a shallow mixing bowl or something. So carnivorous plants in the world are divided into five basic trap types. This is how they trap their prey. Um, so some of the larger ones tend to be pitfall traps. And in this, they trap the prey in some rolled leaf that is full of the digestive enzymes. Um, these are usually the pitcher plants. So they can be aerial or hanging um, off of vines and trees, or they can be terrestrial. So they grow up from the ground or they hang down uh, from where they are. And these are interesting plants because they are known to form symbiotic relationships with several kinds of animals. So they don't digest everything that goes into their plant. Um, in Borneo, there is a species of pitcher plant called Nepenthes uh, ref, refless, <laughs> um, and I wish it had a common name, uh, and it actually uh, lives in symbiosis with the Hardwick's woolly bat, and so it provides a roost for the bat, a nice safe place for it to spend the daytime, and the bat, if you think about it, what do you think this bat might eat? This bat's going to eat uh, a lot of insects. And so what the bat provides is it's guano, it's poop. Um, and so that poop has a lot of the same nitrogen, phosphorus, and the things that the plant needs that uh, is, it's a real, bat guano is a great fertilizer for any plants. So this bat is paying its rent with its poop. Um, similarly, the crab spiders and another species of Nepenthes um, in the Sunda region, which is also near Borneo in that general vicinity, uh, Nepenthes gracilis, um, and the crab spiders. Again, the crab spiders kind of live inside the plant. The plant provides them with some protection, not, not so much protection from predators, um, but it lets them hide from any predators nothing to see here, just a plant hanging out. Um, and then the crab spiders will, uh, will provide the plant with food from its waste or, um, or even some of its leftovers. Uh, so there's that. And similarly, also in Borneo, a lot of symbiosis in Borneo, uh, Nepenthes raja, which is a really, I believe that's the largest species of pitcher plant. Um, and the mountain tree shrew has a similar, similar relationship. Moving on to the second type of trap is the flypaper traps that use their sticky surfaces to trap prey. Now, this is the one that you have in your hot little hands right now. Um, <laughs> so they are sundews, are a big group within this this family or this grouping. And so they have this sticky mucilage on their hairs that they grow. Um, they have been found to live 50 years or even more. Uh, we just know them to live up to 50 years. There's about 200 species. They're found everywhere except Antarctica. And the round leaf sundew is the most common in North America. Now, 
we are just working from cuttings today. So I'm not sure which species um, of Sunday we ended up with in our cuttings because it was already too small by the time I, uh, it, it, it arrived at my house when it got FedExed. So um, it was already in a state that I really could not tell for sure what species it is. And the other type of uh, a fly paper is the airy shaw. So this is one species. This is found uh, native only to Western Africa. In the entire world, there's only three botanical gardens outside of Africa that have been able to grow it. Um, so it's rarely cultivated. I'm not sure why that is. What if it? I would imagine it's fairly difficult if they haven't been doing it. Um, it's kind of cool looking. I would love to to take a stab at it uh, if I had the the resources to do so. Um, but it's kind of neat. It's got these double hooked leaves. And so um, the, the insect would just kind of land on those. So the third type within the flower, the, the sticky paper traps is the butterwort. How could I forget that? Um, and so these, they look kind of like lamb's ear in the style of a plant that they are, the way that their leaves are formed. And the stickiness is directly on the surface of the leaf. And so, um, definitely a cool looking plant. Yeah, so there's no kind of folding, they just kind of absorb it into the leaf structure. Okay. So the third type of trap is the snap trap. And this is the one that everybody thinks of, right? The, they use that rapid leaf movement to enclose the prey. Um, and there's only two living species. The first one is the ever so famous Venus flytrap, uh, very well known and uh, definitely very cool. Inspiration for quite a lot of Halloween decorations these days. Um, and uh, especially for, um, for those who are fans of Little Shop of Horrors. But the lesser known snap trap is called the water wheel. And so this one is native in Europe, Africa, Asia, and Australia. And it is a water-based plant. Um, and so each of these little sections is spinning in the water. And, um, and so it's got these kind of three main petals here. And when a little protozoa or amoeba ends up in that, the three sections snap together. So it's, it's harder to show because I don't have three hands, but kind of all folds in together at once. The fourth trap, this is one that we don't, I feel like we don't talk about a lot because it's a bladder trap. Um, and so this happens uh, underwater. So we don't generally see quite a lot of it. Um, so they suck in the prey by creating a vacuum. And the flowers are the only part of the plant that aren't, that are above the surface of the water or the soil. So there are a few species that are, um, are bladder traps that feed on tiny little uh, microorganisms in the soil. Uh, but most of them are water species. The ones here in Michigan are, um, they're the bladder warts. Uh, and there's about 220 species in the world of these bladder traps. But again, all we see is the flower. So we don't necessarily see them eating insects or eating um, other things. The lobster traps is the fifth and final type of trap. And so they use uh, inward pointing hairs. So on these plants, they have 
they have hairs that are kind of barbed. So they face toward the center of the plant. And when a when an insect, like an ant, say, is crawling on the leaf, they can't, they can only go in toward the center. If they try to back out, then they're gonna end up impaling themselves on these barbs. And so it just keeps continually forcing them uh, into the center of the plant. So they're going to be walking along and they're like, oh, here I am uh, just walking on this leaf. Oh, I've got to get back out. Nope, can't do that. Uh, so they just keep walking toward the center uh, until they end up um, in an area where they are digested. Uh, these corkscrew plants are an example. Um, they are found in Africa, South and Central America. So we don't have any of this type of carnivorous plant, the lobster trap plants here in the United States um, native, but man, they're pretty cool. Um, there's only about 30 species in the world. And some of them actually will have two different sizes of traps. Um, so they will have shorter barbs and longer ones, which are thought to target different sizes of prey. So sometimes maybe seasonally, there are larger insects that are available, but they're only available for one month of the year. So you would use your longer traps and get the bigger things while you can, but then still have kind of the shorter traps as a backup um, if you were that type of carnivorous plant. Um, so then we come to our Michigan carnivorous plants, right? I promised that we would talk about the ones from our own backyards as well as the ones uh, around the world. So we have, um, we have eight different species that are found here in Michigan um, of three different types. So we have the, um, the pitcher plants, we have one species. It's the northern purple pitcher plant. Um, and it is a terrestrial pitcher plant. Um, they grow usually around five or six inches tall is uh, what I've personally seen. Uh, we do have four different species of sundew that are found here. We have the round leaf, uh, bird's nest, English, and the linear leafed sundews. Um, very similar in, uh, in style. The, the round leaf is um, a flatter sundew, I'd say, uh, whereas the bird's nest kind of clumps together in the center and then the leaves kind of droop down. Um, and then we have three species of the bladder warts. So there's the humped, the zigzag, and the horned bladder wart. And so they will, um, they have a yellow kind of flower that we'll see above the water. All of them are at least semi-aquatic. Um, and we're gonna find most of these, um, all of these actually, and generally in low nutrient, very wet environments. Um, a lot of those sphagnum bogs or some wet marley fens, uh, and they all actually can be found, not every species, but every, uh, every genus can be found here in Oakland County. So now, uh, now that we know a little bit more about carnivorous plants, now we want to uh, build a home for one. So in our kits, um, we have some things. Um, so I'm gonna go over the list real quick before I switch to the document camera. Uh, so we have the glass jar, should be in your kit. Uh, some pebbles, gravel, washed play sand, and um, some sphagnum peat moss and also some dried sphagnum moss. Uh, you'll need your sundew cutting, and also um, we need distilled or reverse osmosis filtered water. So this is something that you'll have to continue to use uh, to keep your sundew healthy. 
because these plants are uh, so that since they are known to um, to live in such low nutrient uh, areas, they have to have water that does not have any vitamins or minerals in it. Uh, they need really low nutrient water. <laughs> And so uh, if we use spring water or something like that, that could be too, too rich for them and they would end up uh, not thriving. All right, so we've got our sundew cutting and in here, just as a side note, this is a fully compostable uh, bag that we put the kid in this time. Um, and again, we have the list of things that are in the kit just to make sure that every kit got everything. So in here. So even though this probably says spring water on it, um, we actually just repurposed the bottles and it is reverse osmosis water. Um, a tip for that, if you don't have an, a reverse osmosis filter at home, is that um, all of the, the refill stations at Meyer and Kroger are reverse osmosis filtered. Um, so that is when I, when I go water shopping for my plants at home, uh, that is what I use. I just reuse the same gallon jug um, and go pay 39 cents for a refill when I need to. All right, so. First thing we're going to do is if we can kind of transfer gravel. A lot to start with. Yeah. Our bigger rocks go on the bottom. And this is just going to help uh, a little bit with drainage. And then we put some of the gravel on top there. I'll say too, um, if you're interested and if you get to a point where your sundew gets so big that you decide to try to make a cutting of that as well, um, all it takes is cutting just one of the leaves off and you keep it inside a little sealed container um, at room temperature in direct sunlight inside the distilled water and it will start to grow the little rootlets on the other end. Once we have our bigger pieces of rock and gravel, then we can do the fun stuff. My table's never big enough. So inside may have one container um, that has that has both uh, sand and peat moss in it, or we may have ran short on the larger containers and done one of each. Um, either way, there is sand. Uh, this is washed clay sand. And uh, peat moss from the garden center. Uh, again, the reason that we washed the clay sand is because we don't want to have any minerals or uh, trace elements of any kind inside there. We want to make sure that 
We want to make sure that our soil is as low nutrient as possible uh, because the plants have evolved to get their nutrients from insects and not from, from the soil. So we just kind of mix that all around. Put some of our water in there. And so this is a one-to-one -one ratio. So it was one scoop of whatever container it was that I ended up using. I think I used a, uh, a deli container that somebody's lunch was in our recycling bin um, after we washed it. <laughs> Once it is like a nice brownie mixture, your cake mixture, and a little bit more water to it. I'm really, I'm just wearing the rubber glove because I get a, a little <laughs> anxious about showing uh, my fingernails when they get dirty under the document camera. <laughs> so that's just my vanity thing. <laughs> it's not anything uh, to, to keep my, my oils from contaminating the, the soil or anything like that. All right, and once we have it all mixed up, that's going to be our next layer. In hindsight, what I should have done here is use the folded piece of paper from the kit as a type of funnel to help move the soil mixture into the jar. Um, hopefully that tip helps you out. So once that layer is in, um, I'm going to add the rest of my water. Uh, so the next thing that we do is we have our envelope of dried moss. Now, what I've learned when it comes to the dried moss is it's not necessary for the carnivorous plant to put the dried moss in. They don't really care if it's there or not, but the conditions for a carnivorous plant are exactly the same as that of sphagnum moss. And so, but the sphagnum moss will start growing uh, sooner than the carnivorous plant will. So if your dried sphagnum um, starts to, to flower and to grow, then you know you're doing everything right and your carnivorous plant is well on its way. Um, it's a good indicator. Um, so then what I'm just gonna do is lay that kind of on the top and make a little hollow well in the center. I'm just going to carefully take my, my cutting out. Um, this is 
this is where I suggested tweezers or chopsticks or something to, to hold it with. Um, and then you just kind of lay it down in there so that it reaches the soil. And just pour the rest of the water in there for it. And then we have I'm clean it up a little bit. And then we've got our, our terrarium. So he's not very impressive right now. Um, and it might take a little while since we're doing this in the fall. Um, it's great because plants in the fall time are they're working on growing under the ground rather than on top of the ground. Um, so hopefully his work, his root system will take off. Um, room temperature is fine year round. Um, they, they'll just be a little bit dormant in the winter time. Um, they just need a cycle where they're they're just a little bit a little bit chillier. Um, and so, that's part of their normal cycle. Um, we leave, we can leave the cover off a terrarium if you're, and you have to leave them for a few days without, you know, checking on the water level. Um, you can also put just a bit of saran wrap over the top um, to help keep the water level in, to help keep it humid um, for your plant. And then you won't have to check on them as much. Uh, they do only eat insects about once a month or so. Um, so if this was your solution for uh, a whole host of fruit flies or something, um, <laughs> unfortunately, that is not going to be the, um, one plant is not going to be the answer to that. Um, but if you every once in a while have um, a little pesky fruit fly come in your house, you know, um, maybe as often as once every two weeks, they will have a little snack. Um, and so we just keep them without a lid and, and let them feed themselves generally uh, from, they'll attract all of those, um, those little gnats and things. How, how sunny of an area should the plant be kept in? Right, so they are um, used to being in a bog where there's a lot of other taller plants around. Um, so indirect sunlight is best. Uh, you just need uh, a little bit of light every now and then. I have a, a screen in enclosed porch and that's where I've been keeping the cuttings. Um, so they were very happy there. Nothing, nothing overhead just coming in through the window. That's the, uh, the Sunday terrarium. Um, feel free to you know take a picture and share it to our facebook group we would love to see you know i always say that but nobody yet has actually shown me a photo of how theirs turned out <laughs> or shared it with us so i would love to see um see what you do with it all right we'll try <laughs> awesome uh also another thing you could do is the, it's just a glass spaghetti jar but um Sharpie markers, if you wanted to decorate it, if you wanted to even go so far as to take like white out or, to, or a paint pen, it might be fun to draw like little dinosaur skeletons or something. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for coming tonight and for having, um, for purchasing this take and make kit. And I hope to see you around Red Oaks and uh, have a great night. <laughs>